if you look from the top, that's a top view. So for example, here's a silicon wafer, and you'll see a shape like this, and with two contacts, that's from the top, it's looking from top to bottom. If you do the cross-sectional view, so for example, you cut it from here, like a cutting a pie, and looking, looking from the side, and you're going to see something like this. And this is called unwell. <clears throat> and uh, so we are going to introduce the semiconductor physics in the following lectures. But now, just tomorrow, it's just a simple layout. You don't have to understand what's actually going on. Uh, just uh, know that that specific material is called unwell. Uh, and it has a parameter called sheet resistance. <clears throat> so it's defined as um, following, right? So just looking at the shape, and you know it's not a 2D uh, object, right? It's a 3D object. Since you dope that anti material into the silicon wafer, so that's the silicon substrate or the wafer. And it's a 3D material, like a cylinder or something. Um, so if you draw it, it looks like this. Um, right, something like that. And so here will be the lens. For example, here is a lens, right? I just, just assume that, that this piece of material is unwell here. And that's the width. And that's the thickness. So for the same procedure, the cheap fabrication procedure, they have the same thickness. It depends on the time you heat it up. If you just put it in the furnace for the same amount of time, it's going to be the same thickness. So it's not changing. So T is not changing. But the width and length, what about these two dimensions? It's actually here and here, right? These two. Can you design these two? So when you are drawing the circuit layout, you're actually drawing something from like a top view. You are not drawing a cross-sectional view. You are drawing from the top. You are like, if you lay out a box like this, it has a length and width like that. So you can define, you can design different lenses and different width at the, at the same time. And there's a parameter is called sheet resistance came from this, right? So R, we know that R equals to here's the resistivity the length over T times W. And why is that? So here's T, right? So this is T, this is W. So T times W is what? The cross-sectional area, right? This area of this little square. So what is L over everything here? So this came from the resistor's definition, resistance definition, remember? So R equals to this, or A, usually you use A. From physics, right? Did you learn that? So the resistance of a resistor, like a rod resistor, A equals to this. Resistivity depends on the materials, property, times the length of the resistor over the area, cross-sectional area of the resistor. So if you have a longer wire, or longer resistor, you get higher resistance. If you get a larger cross-sectional area, you get lower resistance. Okay, it's the same here. It applies to the same material. Uh, 
the same principle applies to this different material. So it's, it's a resistivity of uh, this n-type semiconductor times L over A. And if you convert it into this form, it's also valid. Sorry, this is W. L over W times this constant. Six is the same time, same amount of time you heat it up that uh, material in the furnace. Resistivity is the property of the material, it's not changing. So this is a constant. And L over W will be the resistance. Huh? No, it's uh, you have bigger area, you have more metal. You, got, you just think about the pipe. So the definition of the water current, uh, or the definition of the electric, electrical current is the uh, in a unit amount of time, how much charges flow through that piece of cross-sectional area, right? It's like if you have a pipe or have an electrical, have a wire, metal wire, you cut it and you just slice it into one cross-sectional uh, piece. And so the definition of the electrical current is amount of charges flow through that piece per second. So if you have a larger piece or slice, you can imagine there will be more charge flow through it. Same as the, uh, the water pipe. Yeah, like a um, current flow, water flow, very similar. <clears throat> And for this one, this parameter, this parameter is a constant, it's called sheet resistance. And you just need to know what's the ratio of L and W. So that means if I looking at the top view here, if I have a uh, square like this or a square like this do they have the same resistance top top view I'm looking from the top like this if you cut it what's the cross-sectional view looks like Do they have the same thickness? Depths into the material. Yes. Why? Same amount of time in the furnace. Do they have the same resistance? And why? What's what's the uh, definition of the resistance of this material? What's what's determ determines the resistance? L over W, do they have the same L to W ratio? These two squares. Yes, they do. They are both one. So they have the same resistance. You say, hey, you just said, you have a bigger metal, you get more current flow. That's your question, right? This one definitely have a smaller metal, why still the same resistance? It's smaller here, but also smaller here. <laughs> it's shorter, right? This this is wider, but this is longer as well. You know, so you couldn't tell. Like this looks bigger, so you have a bigger area to flow that current. So it seems like this has a lower resistance. This is a bigger metal piece, but it's also longer, right? So anyway, just, you know, you, you can think about that intuitively, but anyway, just look at the equation, and this should be the same, should be the same resistance. So that's why when you are calculating resistance of the N wells, you just look at how many squares it has. For example, this guy, one square, two square, three squares. So the resistance will be 
the square, the, the sheet resistors times how many squares? That making sense? No, because all the resistance equals to this equation. And whenever you are laying out the resistor, it must have a length and width. And you only need to look at the length and width to calculate it. And this sheet resistance is constant. Uh, if, if it's given like you are laying out something in that technology, you're always having the same sheet resistance. So you just need to know what is this. If you, so for example, this is 800 ohms. There's my marker. My red marker. Weird. It's the last one. Anyway, if this is 800 ohms, uh, you, I'm asking you to design a 2.4 K ohm resistor. How to lay it out? You need a three squares, right? It can be three big squares, can be three small squares. So which one you want to choose? One. Less area. So you only have a little tiny chip to lay out all the circuits on that. So just pick up the smallest what? Width. And then define the lens to find out the resistance. But sometimes, for example, you have a chip that's a size allows you to lay out everything is one millimeter one millimeter on each side it's a square die silicon die that's the final chip it's a final chip so you but you have a pretty large resistor like one million ohms or something or even larger and you find out you pick up this space as the smallest width and you calculate it goodness the resistor like this long <laughs> how, how, how do you tackle this problem? No, if you make it wider, then it should be even longer, right? I mean, or it's not, yeah, it should be even longer. This is the ratio. Same ratio. It's just rotated, right? Just like this. Get it? So make something like this. Zigzag, yeah. like this you know whatever you can you can make it work right <clears throat> all right that's what's gonna happen in the uh, tomorrow's lab right, anyway That's why it looks like this, right? Come here to here, then rotate, and then like this. Like snake. Mm -hmm. And after you are done, replace. Wait, do you need to simulate the layout? Seems like not, so you don't have to. Yeah, just follow. I said I couldn't remember where is uh, where is this from so it's just schematic so it's just schematic yeah all right <clears throat> okay let's look at some examples for star ADC here So remember the structure or architecture of the star ADC. It has a <clears throat> input, sample and hold, 
then what? Op amp is some control circuit or timing circuit. And then a SAR logic. And then a DAC. Then feed it back to the inverting terminal of the op amp of the comparator. B3, B2, B1, B0. That's V in. That's a VRAF is 10 volts. So last time, what's the input voltage we used to run through all the states? 5.2. So let's use a smaller one, like 4.2 this time. So reference voltage is still 10 volts, okay? So what's the beginning state? What's the first state you want to assign to these ones? Always. One, zero, zero, zero. And what is that? Five volts, right? Is it five volts? Wait, is it five volts? How to calculate it? One zero 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 over what? Two to the uh, fourth times ten. What is this? Does a over what? Sixteen times ten. Is that five volts? So one zero 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 is five volts. So where is that five volts? Where is that five volts shows up? Here? Yeah. So 4.2 here, 5 here, then what for the comp? 1 or 0. What is comp? Wait, comparator. Don't look at the notes. Just look at the comparator. I got 4.2 volts here. I got 5 volts here. Boom. What? 0. Is that clear? Why 0? Yeah, super negative, and it's going to saturate as a ground because it's the lowest uh, potential this part supply can offer. So what's the next state, though? So these will be shifted to the right. Yeah. And what is this? 4 over 16 times 10 volts. 2.5? So 2.5 here this time. What is comp? 1. You see how that works? Whenever this is pretty small, it's going to try to give multiple ones to bring it up to whatever this is, right? So now comp is one, so you want to insert this one to where? To here, right? After zero, but before one. So that will be zero, one, one, zero, right? And what is that? Zero, one, one, zero. Four plus two is six. So six over 16 times 10, Zero point seven five. <clears throat> so here's three point seven five. Here's also three point seven five. And comp is still one. And you are getting because you want to plug in this one to here, so you're getting zero one one one. And that is <laughs> Seven. Seventy over sixteen. Seventy over sixteen. 
4.375 is getting closer and closer to 4.2. Good news, right? Are you done? What's next? So uh, 4.375, it's been smaller than 4.2, but now, boom, it's just like bigger than 4.2. So comp equals to zero for the last state. And you insert that zero to here to form that 0110. And what is that? Yeah, still 0 0.75. And that will be the final result. Although this looks closer to 4.2 and this is not, but the SAR algorithm is going to pick up this one instead of this one. All right? And if you're saying this is not good enough, just to increase the number of bits to make it more sensitive so you can get it closer to 4.2. So I'm, saying, I'm asking, like, for example, if there's some glitches to the system, it's still running another state. Is it going to change the result or not? Then that won't be a problem. So the next, because everything has been shifted out. So if you compare 3.75 to 4.2, what's the result? It's one, right? But the thing is, there's nowhere to plug it, to plug in that one, because everything has been shifted out and it's already occupied all the resistors. I'm going to show the architecture pretty soon. You want to say, hey, here's COM is one. I'm going to plug this one to here, right? But there's nowhere to store it. You only have four bits. So it's not going to do anything. It's still keeping that number there forever. It's keep keeping that forever. So it's just in the five states. If you run more, it's not doing anything to the circuit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what this one, this algorithm does. But not really as close as possible because you can see this number actually is closer. It's just picking up the last one because of the low sensitivity uh, resolution. Okay, so we want to implement that circuit to a, implement the algorithm to a circuit. Right, that's what we are going to do. <clears throat> but before that, let's draw a summary table for all the states. Um, B3, B2, B1, B0. That's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So when it's zero, it's just nothing. And at the first cycle, I need the output. So these bits are these bits. So I need this one to be what? So for example, these are the comparators output are being named as A's, right? So A1, A3, A2, A1s. And there will be a, if the first one here, what we want to write down here, will be the first comparator's output. And let's just name it as A3. Is that correct? The first cycle. Hmm? Yeah. The first cycle, no. First cycle is 100. Zero, zero. Right? And the second cycle, you plug in the comparator's output and shift 
everything to the left, to the right. Here? Yeah. These are different cycles. Yeah, I just read it to six, but actually there are only five. <clears throat> so A3, and then plugging another one at cycle three, it's A3, A2, one zero, and A3, A2, A1, and one here, and A3, A2, A1, A0. And the final result will be the comparator's output, all the outputs of, uh, from the comparator, and combined into a four-bit number. So whenever you are doing the, using this one to find out the final digital results, and the very, at the very last state, all the numbers are actually the comparator's output. They're just being stored and placed in the final results, right? If you just look at this table, it's more, um, you know, picture. When you are looking at the picture, it's easier to, to let you guys remember the procedure and algorithm. So that's why I want to still draw the table. Although I think you already understand what's going on here, but it's, just, it's good to have a table like that. And <clears throat> then let's start from the flip flops. Do a really quick review on flip flops. <clears throat> if you want to do a review on flip flops, we need to look at the reason. We, so here is the logic. <clears throat> we need to implement this algorithm to a circuit in the star logic block. And we need a flip flops which can be reset and set. Okay? So we, that's why I want to do a review on flip-flops. And if you want to do a review on flip-flops, yeah, we have to start with latches. So you may have already forgotten what are latches. What are these gates? Nine gates. So which one is R, which one is S? Why? Just 50% 50, 50 chance. <laughs> Good guess. Let's just do this and see if this is wrong. So what does R and what does S mean? Set and reset. <clears throat> so set and reset. Set means when it's one, Q is one. So this one means it's on. So when you turn on the set, the Q, which is the result here, so if we define this part, this pin is Q, this will be Q bar. And if we turn on the set pin, the Q will be set. Here's the result, right? So here's a Q. So Q will be set to one. For reset, if we turn on the reset, Q should be what? So you are resetting the circuit, so Q equals to zero. So that's a rule, okay? Now let's see. Because for this flip, uh, for this slash, we do not directly just give a S equals to R equals to zero or S equals to R to one, because we are not using this kind of states to uh, control the output. So the valid, the valid input signals are what? They are either like S, uh, one zero or zero one like that, or they are one one. If they are one one, what's gonna happen? If they are one one here, so one to the NAND gate, if you have, for example, A, and one, right, like a non-logic, what is that? It's still a not, right? It's not affecting the result. If you're feeding a one to the non gate, it's not affecting the result. But if you're feeding a zero to the non gate, what's gonna happen? The Q the non gate. So I usually use this term. It's gonna kill the non gate. 
because whatever A is, doesn't matter because it's going to be 1. Make sense? Okay? So if both S and R are 1s, what's going to happen to Qs? Q and Q bar. Are 1s, then it's just uh, performing like a memory. It's holding the perfect state. For example, let's just verify it. For example, this is 0, this is 1, right? The reason I got this is, for example, that before I make these two to be ones, I have a uh, one zero, for example, okay? So the Q and Q bar will be zero one. And now, after a, a few milliseconds, I just, boom, flip uh, S and make both of them to be one. So now is at, during that time frame, these are all the voltages appear as these nodes. So zero here, zero here, one here, one here. So one, one, nand. What is the result? Zero. Is it changing? No. So zero is going to kill the nand gate, you're getting one. Is it changing? No. So what does that mean? It's stable. It's not changing. So it's fine. They can be roommates. They can live together. So it's not changing at all. It's just stable. If this is still one, it's going to be one. If this is one, it will be one. So that means, previously it was zero, one, and now I changed these two things to be ones, and it's not changing the results. So that means this is a memory. Right now it's a memory. It can hold the values. So if S and, zero, S and R are ones, it's a memory. But if S and R are zeros, what's, what's going to happen? We all say that zero, zero and zero, these two inputs, this combination is not allowed for the flip-flop. So what does that mean? Like, why it's not allowed? Is it, is it going to burn the uh, latch or blow it up or you know, what's going to happen? <laughs> No, you got two zeros. So the two zeros will kill the two nine gates and give you two ones. And then what? It's not helping. We just don't use it, right? I, I hope this one can be Q bar. And no, it's not Q bar. But other than that, any other issues? No, it's just like nothing. Nothing wrong. It's not going to blow it up. It's just not valid input. Okay? We just don't use it, zero, zero, to kill the latch. It's not making sense. So now after that, let's look at other combinations of the inputs. For example, S equals to one, R equals to zero. That's one of the, in, uh, one of the valid inputs, right? One, zero. So when you are looking at, no, since so you said on the top is R, right? I'm just giving you an example. What if this is S, this is R? See if that works. So if this is S, this is R, and I give one to S, and S is a setting, right? I'm giving one, I turn on the setting function, which means I'm trying to set it, right? And now let's see if this is being set. It's very simple to verify. If, if this is one, you couldn't tell because one is not going to affect anything. So I have to start from here. Zero is going to kill this nine gate, give you a one. And one will be fed back to here. You got one here, one here, two ones, and you are getting zero. Are you setting the Q? No. So this won't be S. This is going to be R. You know how to verify it? If you forget it, it's fine. Just verify it like this. Okay? So for this nine gate latch, it's going to be R on the top and S at the bottom. Another one. So this is called SR latch. <clears throat> 
So now the inputs are here behind these two extra NAND gates. <clears throat> which ones S, which ones R, and what type of flip flop it is right now. And is this add trigger or level trigger? And what does that mean? So first, which is S, which is R? Let's assume top is S, bottom is R. Why? Because here for the latch is top is R, bottom is S, and now it's being inverted it's because the NAND gate performs very similar as an inverter when the lock clock is high. So it's very reasonable to believe that top will be S instead. And now let's verify if that's true. If S is one or zero, so why I'm assuming S is one and R must be zero, why I'm not giving like zero, zero at the same time? If they are both zeros, what's gonna, what's gonna happen for this one? Both are zeros, then what are these two? Ones, and then what's happening for this flip flop? Zero, zero, zero here. No, no, no. If th these are both zeros, you are getting ones here. And what's the state? What's the what's the, or you can say what's the mode? It's a memory mode. Remember, we get a one one. It's not affecting the results. Whatever it used to be, it's gonna still be that. It's gonna memorize the previous result. So whenever these two points are one ones, it's a memory. It's different from this one because you have an extra NAND gate. So whenever these tools are both zeros, it's a memory. And when they are both ones, and when clock is high, you got all ones here. So you got zero, zero. It's gonna kill the two NAND gates. It's an invalid input. So for this one, the invalid inputs are one ones, not zero, zeros, like this one. Okay, so now let's look at the valid inputs, like R10. <clears throat> if clock is low, if clock is zero, there are ones. Memory. So we only, we're only interested in when clock is high, right? If it's not high, it's just memory. It's not, we don't have to do any analysis. So whenever clock is one, then it start working. It's gonna activate the flip-flop. So these are ones. And one, one, what is this? Zero. Zero, one, what is this? One. S or R. S or R? R. S or R? S. Is S turn on or R turn on? Did you turn on the S or did you turn on R? Yeah, S is on. So if S is on, Q equals to what? It's been set. Is S1? Is Q1? So it's top S, bottom R. Yeah, so for this one, it's SR. For this one, it's RS. Make sense? Okay. <clears throat> now, deeply flop. So what's this called? What's this called? So name of this guy. S R flip flop. Now let's look at D flip flop. For a very simple D flip flop, one more question here. So for this S R flip flop, is this edge triggered or level triggered? Level trigger, 
why is level triggered? So level level trigger means whenever clock is on, the, all the data will be transferred to queue. So it's not being blocked or controlled by anything else. Edge trigger means it only sample the data at the edge. Then it's going to memorize. The disadvantage of level trigger is whenever clock is high, if this one changes at some point, Q will be changed as well. The advantage of rising edge trigger or falling edge trigger is it only samples S at this moment. And then whenever if S changes afterwards, it's not going to change the Q at all. Because it's, there's no, no there's uh, isn't another rising edge after that. So it's totally just a level. So it's not triggering the change of the output. So is this level triggered or edge triggered? It's definitely a level triggered because whenever clock's on, whatever here is, it's going to be transferred to Q. So this flip flop, flop, I know, yeah. So zero and ones are, they are just numbers. It doesn't matter is from like which pin, right? If you got a one here, it's setting the Q. If you get a zero here, I'm assuming it's a, it's a valid input combination. If zero, zero here, it must be one here. So if S is zero, Q will be zero as well. So can I just say like S equals to Q? Or I want to say just like whenever it's being triggered, S, whatever S is, doesn't matter. So S is being sent to Q. It's right? just same number. And whenever clock is on, whatever S is, it's going to be sent to Q. Is that right? You don't have another extra door or control in between. It's a combination of logic. Whenever S changes, it's going to directly affect the Q, which is bad. So you need some edge trigger. Only sample, only sample that S as a moment. And whenever it's keep high, logic high, it's not going to uh, affect the result. It's going to be a memory. It's going to remember that. So this is a, a level trigger. And we do hope we can have an edge trigger, but the circuit can be a, a lot more complicated. But before we move on to that edge trigger flip flop, let's look at the D flip flop first. It's very similar to the SR flip flop. We probably won't be able to do the homework uh, that I put on the website for today's homework, uh, but it's due next uh, Monday, Wednesday. You'll be ready after uh, Wednesday's lecture. <clears throat> so here's a clock. Here's S R right, and the flip flop is invert S, and output the inverted result to R. So we don't need R anymore because it's just need a one input. <clears throat> and you now call it D, but not S. The reason we call it D because it's data. Why is data? Remember, we, we were looking at the SR flip flop. What is actually being sent to Q whenever clock is high? S, right? So S is being sent to Q whenever clock is high. So S, we just call it data. So whatever the data is, it's going to be sent to Q. So that is the data. It's the same values, same numbers. So that's called the data. So that's, kind of, that's why it's called flip flop. <clears throat> you can design a, uh, this is level trigger, right? And we can design an add trigger D flip flop. <clears throat> uh, let me see how I draw the circuit. Still send me an hour. That's what we learn in logic. It's called the master slave D flip flop.
it can be used in some situations, but definitely not a perfect one. And we are not going to use this one for our star IDC because it's not working for our purposes. It's not the best one to use. <clears throat> So that's the edge triggered if we flop. And it's a master slave. If we flop, here's the master stage, here's a slave stage. They look very similar like two SR flip-flops. Because there's a problem of it. But before we look at the problem, let's see how that works. <laughs> and we know that this D flip-flop is always sending what to where? It's sending S to Q. Right? This guy is not doing too, my, too many things except for just sending whatever here to here. Whenever it's being triggered, that's it. That's all about SR flip-flop. Okay, and this is being, this is inverted of Q. And sending this one to here and then invert it, you get Q bar, and that's it. So same as this guy. So you have one SR flip-flop, so it's gonna send whatever here to here. And it's also sending here to here. Is it changing the results? For example, D to here, here to here. Is it inverting? Like D to here becomes D bar and D bar inverted becomes D. Is, is it? Is it how that works? Or is it just directly transfer this D to here and then here? It's not inverting D because you can see it's not inverting it. Right? Whenever it's triggered, it's gonna directly send whatever here to here. So now it's not inverted. But we need the two stages to control the, um, have an actual control in the middle. So it's not directly sending the results to the final queue. So it can stay here for a little bit to wait for another rising edge. So before we determine if this is rising edge or falling edge triggered, can you tell me, is this rising edge triggered or falling edge triggered and why? Just look at the clock. So the way to look at to find out that answer is if clock is high, if clock is high, so if this is one, this is zero, right? If this is zero, can you send S to Q? No. So is this falling at trigger or rising at trigger? So you are thinking, well, this like, can be confusing. Why is the edge? Like, what's the magic of the edge? If we zoom in the edge, if you do not zoom in, it looks like this, right? If you zoom in, it looks like this. Is that correct? So what's the magic of the edge? Why is it, gonna be, why is it able to trigger something? If the rising edge, you are actually looking at the 2.5 volts threshold. It happens whenever it's higher than 2.5 to trigger the logic to flip. You are still looking at high. You still want to treat this guy as a voltage high. It only happens at during a very short period of time. So the rising edge is still a one. And falling edge, if you zoom in, you are looking at the 2.5. Whenever it's lower than 
if it's a five volts logic, it's lower than 2.5, it's going to be treated as a zero, it's going to trigger that, still logic, uh, logic low. So whenever I'm, for example, when I'm thinking like, hey, if it's a, here's the original clock, I assume it's a rising edge trigger. So rising edge trigger, which means this guy is one. Just happened during a very short period of time. A very short one. A very short one will give you a very short zero. A very short zero will not do anything, will not send this guy to here. So it's not triggering the change of the deal. So it's not rising edge trigger. There should be falling edge trigger. Why? Because whenever the it's falling edge, whenever it crosses the 2.5 and getting lower, it's being treated as a zero. So we got a one here and got a one here. So that one at that moment is going to send this guy to here. So there are more details about this that I'm going to introduce on Wednesday. And there are a lot more things as well. So the practical diffie flower we're going to use for our star IDC, but not this one. And yeah, that's very interesting because no one is going to learn that that diffie flop structure anywhere in any classes. I found it from an IC chip schematic data sheet, which has a set and had a set and reset functions. You know this one, this uh, master slave diffie flop. You can find it in any textbooks on the market, but it's just not working. Is that interesting? Like all oh, the professors just never design circuits on chips, or they just never know it's gonna <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, I don't know. It's just funny. We should we should write a new textbook just for uh, SARDCs.